ओम साई नाथाय नम साई सचरित्र चैप्टर टू ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ राइटिंग द वर्क इन कैपेसिटी एंड बोलनेस इन द अंडरटेकिंग हॉट डिस्कशन कन्फेरिंग सिग्निफिकेंट एंड प्रोफेटिक टाइटल ऑफ हेमद पंथ निसेसिटी ऑफ अ गुरु In the last chapter the author mentioned in the original Marathi book that he would state the reason that led him to undertake the work and the persons qualified to read the same and such other points now in this chapter he starts to tell the same object of writing the work in the first chapter i described sai baba's miracle of checking and destroying the epidemic of cholera by grinding wheat and throwing the flour on the outskirts of the village I heard other miracles of Sai Baba to my great delight and this delight burst forth into this poetic work. I also thought that the description of these grand miracles of Sai Baba would be interesting and instructive to his devotees and would remove their sins and so I began to write the sacred life and teachings of Sai Baba. The life of the saint is neither logical nor dialectical. it shows us the true and great path incapacity and boldness in undertaking the work hemat pan thought that he was not a fit person to undertake the work he said i do not know the life of my intimate friend nor do i know my own mind then how can i write the life of a saint or describe the nature of incarnations which even the vedas were unable to do one must be a saint himself before he could know other saints then how can i describe their glory to write the life of a saint is the most difficult the one may as well measure the depth of the water of the seven seas or enclose the sky with cloth trappings i knew that this was the most venturous undertaking which might expose me to ridicule i therefore invoke sai baba's grace the premier poet saint of maharashtra Sri Ganeshwar Maharaj has stated that the Lord loves those who write the lives of saints and the saints also have a peculiar method of their own of getting the service which the devotees long for successfully accomplished the saints inspire the work the devotee becomes only an indirect cause or instrument to achieve the end for instance In 1700 Shaka year the poet Mahipati aspired to write the lives of saints saints inspired him and got the work done so also in 1800 Shaka year Das Ganu's service was accepted the former wrote four works Bhakt Vijaya Sant Vijaya Bhakt Leela Amrit and Sant Kathamrit while the latter wrote two Bhakt Leela Amrit and Sant Katha Amrit in which the lives of modern saints were described in chapters 31 32 33 of Bhakt Leela Amrit and in chapter 57 of Sant Katha Amrit the sweet life and teachings of Sai Baba are very well depicted these have been separately published in Sai Leela magazine numbers 11 and 12 volume 17 the readers are advised to read these chapters So also Sai Baba's wonderful leelas are described in a small decent book named Shri Sai Nath Bhajan Mala by Mrs Savitri Bai Raghunath Tendulkar of Bandra. Das Ganu Maharaj also has composed various sweet poems on Sai Baba. A devotee named Amidas Bhavani Mehta has also published some stories of Sai Baba in Gujarati. Some numbers of Sai Nath Prabha A magazine published by Dakshina Bhiksha Sanstha of Shirdi are also published. Then the question of objection comes in that while so many works regarding Sai Baba are extant, why should this such charitra be written? And where is its necessity? The answer is plain and simple. The life of Sai Baba is as wide and deep as the infinite ocean. and all can dive deep into the same and take out precious gems of knowledge and bhakti and distribute them to the aspiring public the stories parables and teachings of sai baba are very wonderful they will give peace and happiness to the people who are afflicted with sorrows and heavily loaded with miseries of this worldly existence and also bestow knowledge and wisdom 
both in the worldly and in spiritual domains. If these teachings of Sai Baba, which are as interesting and instructive as the Vedic lore, are listened to and meditated upon, the devotees will get what they long for, that is, union with Brahman, mastery in eightfold yoga, bliss of meditation, etc. So I thought that I should call these stories together that would be my best upasana. This collection would be most delightful to those simple souls whose eyes were not blessed with Sai Baba's darshan. So, I set about collecting Sai Baba's teachings and expressions, the outcome of his boundless and natural self-realization. It was Sai Baba who inspired me in this matter. In fact, I surrendered my ego at his feet and thought that my path was clear and that he would make me quite happy here and in the next world. I could not myself ask Sai Baba to give me permission for this work. So I requested Mr. Madhavrao Deshpande, alias Shama, Baba's most intimate devotee to speak to him for me. He pleaded for my cause and said to Sai Baba, This Anna Saab wishes to write your biography. Don't say that you are a poor begging fakir and there is no necessity to write it. But if you agree and help him, he will write or rather your feet or grace will accomplish the work. Without your consent and blessing, nothing can be done successfully. When Sai Baba heard this request, he was moved and blessed me by giving me his Uri, sacred ashes, and placing his boon bestowing hand on my head and said, let him make a collection of stories and experiences, keep notes and memos. I will help him. He is only an outward instrument. I should write myself my autobiography and satisfy the wishes of my devotees. He should get rid of his ego, place or surrender it at my feet. He who acts like this in life, him I help the most. What of my life stories? I serve him in his house in all possible ways. When his ego is completely annihilated and there is left no trace of it, I, myself, shall enter into him and shall myself write my own life. Hearing my stories and teachings will create faith in devotees' hearts and they will easily get self-realization and bliss. Let there be no insistence on establishing one's own view. No attempt to refute others' opinions. No discussions of pros and cons of any subject. The word discussion put me in mind of my promise to explain the story of my getting the title of Hemad Pant. And now I begin to relate the same. I was on close friendly terms with Kaka Sahib Dikshit and Nana Sahib Chandorkar. They pressed me to go to Shirti and have Baba's Darshan and I promised them to do so. But something in the interval turned up, which prevented me from going to Shirti. The son of a friend of mine at Lunavla fell ill. My friend tried all possible means, physical and spiritual, but the fever would not abate. At length, he got his guru to sit by the bedside of his son, but this too was of no avail. Hearing this, I thought, what was the utility of the guru if he could not save my friend's son? If the Guru can't do anything for us, why should I go to Shirdi at all? Thinking in this way, I postponed my Shirdi trip. But the inevitable must happen and it happened in my case as follows. Mr. Nana Sahib Chandorkar, who was a Pranat officer, was going on tour to Basen. From Thana, he came to Dadar and was waiting for a train bound for Basen. In the meanwhile, a Bandra local turned up. He sat in it and came to Bandra and sent for me and took me to task for putting off my Shirdi trip. Nana's argument for my Shirdi trip was convincing and delightful and so I decided to start for Shirdi the same night. I packed up my luggage and started for Shirdi. I planned to go to Dadar and there to catch the train for Manmad and so I booked myself for Dadar and sat in the train. While the train was to start, a Mohammedan came hastily to my compartment and seeing all my paraphernalia, asked me where was I bound. I told him my plan. 
He then suggested that I should go straight to Bori Bandar and not get down at Dadar. For the Manmat mail did not get down at Dadar at all. If this little miracle or Leela had not happened, I would not have reached Shirdi next day as settled and many doubts would have assailed me. But this was not to be. As fortune favoured me, I reached Shirdi the next day before 9 or 10 a.m. Mr. Bhau Saib, Kaka Dikshit, was waiting for me there. This was in 1910 AD, when there was only one place, that is, Sathezwara for lodging pilgrim devotees. After alighting from the Tonga, I was anxious to have darshan. When the great devotee, Tatta Saheb Nulkar, returned from the masjid and said that Sai Baba was at the corner of the Vara and that I should first get the preliminary darshan and then, after bath, see him at leisure. Hearing this, I ran and prostrated before Baba and then my joy knew no bounds. I found more than what Nana Chandorkar had told me. All my senses were satisfied and I forgot thirst and hunger. The moment I touched Sai Baba's feet, I began a new lease of life. I felt myself much obliged to those who spurred and helped me to get the darshan and I considered them as my real relatives and I cannot repay their debt. I only remember them and prostrate before them. The peculiarity of Sai Baba's darshan as I found it is that by his darshan our thoughts are changed, the force of previous actions is abated and gradually non-attachment of dispassion towards worldly objects grows up. It is by the merit of actions in many past births that such darshan is got and if only you see Sai Baba, really all the world becomes or assumes the form of Sai Baba. Hot Discussion On the first day of my arrival in Shirdi, there was a discussion between me and Bala Sahib Bhate regarding the necessity of a guru. I contended, why should we lose our freedom and submit to others? When we have to do our duty, why, a guru is necessary. One must try his best and save himself. What can the guru do to a man who does nothing but sleeps indolently? Thus I pleaded free will while Mr. Bhate took up the other side, that is, destiny, and said, Whatever is bound to happen must happen. Even great men have failed. Man proposes one way, but God disposes the other way. Brush aside your cleverness, pride or egoism won't help you. This discussion with all its pros and cons went on for an hour or so and as usual, no decision was arrived at. We had to stop the discussion ultimately as we were exhausted. The net result of this was that I lost my peace of mind and found that unless there is strong body consciousness and egoism, there would be no discussion. In other words, it is egoism which breeds discussion. Then, when we went to the masjid with others, Baba asked Kaka Sahib Dikshit the following. What was going on in the Sathezwara? What was the discussion about? And staring at me, Baba further added, What did this Himad Pant say? Hearing these words, I was much surprised. The masjid was at a considerable distance from Satezwara, where I was staying and where the discussion was going on. How could Baba know our discussion unless he be omniscient, an inner ruler of us all? Significant and prophetic title I began to think why Sai Baba should call me by the name Himadpant. This word is a corrupt form of Himadripant. This Himadripant was a well-known minister of the kings Mahadev and Ramdev of Devgiri of the Yadav dynasty. He was very learned, good-natured and the author of good works such as Chaturvarga, Chintamani dealing with spiritual subjects and Raj Prashasti. He invented and started new methods of accounts and was the originator of the Modi, Marathi shorthand script. But I was quite the opposite, an ignoramus and have dull, mediocre intellect. So I could not understand why the name or title was conferred upon me 
but thinking seriously upon it i thought that the title was a dart to destroy my ego so that i should always remain meek and humble it was also a compliment paid to me for the cleverness in the discussion looking to the future history we think that baba's word calling mr dabolkar by the name hemat pant was significant and prophetic as we find that he looked after the management of sai sansthan very intelligently kept nicely all the accounts and was also the author of such a good work sai satcharitra which deals with such important and spiritual subjects as gyan bhakti and dispassion self surrender and self realization about the necessity of a guru hemat pant has left no note no memo about what baba said regarding this subject but kaka sahib dikshit has published his notes regarding this matter next day after hemat pant's meeting with sai baba kaka sahib went to baba and asked whether he should leave shirdi baba said yes then someone asked baba where to go baba said high up then the man said how is the way baba said there are many ways leading there there is one way also from here that is shirdi the way is difficult there are tigers and wolves in the jungles on the way i kaka sahib asked but baba what if we take a guide with us baba answered then there is no difficulty the guide will take you straight to your destination avoiding wolves tigers and ditches etc on the way if there be no guide there is the danger of your being lost in the jungles or falling into the ditches mr dabolkar was present on this occasion and he thought that this was the answer baba gave to the question whether guru was a necessity and he thereupon took the hint that no discussion of the problem whether the man is free or bound is of any use in spiritual matters but that on the contrary real paramarth is possible only as the result of the teachings of the guru as is illustrated in this chapter of the original work in the instances of great avatars like ram krishna who had to submit themselves to their gurus vashishta and sandipani respectively for getting self realization and that the only virtues necessary for such progress are faith and patience bow to shri sai peace be to all om sai ram <laughs>